Okay. So, okay. <laughs> yeah. This is not going to be a long stream. Um, it's not going to be a long, long stream. I think we'll, we'll do about 45 minutes to an hour today. It's just going to be on one topic, and then we'll probably do a brief 10 to 15 minute uh, Q&A. But you know how sometimes I say it won't be long, and then it ends up being longer than I expect. Um, so as the title suggests, I'm going to be going through... The U.S. is likely schedule for Qatar 2022 qualifiers. I have pen and paper here. I'm going to be taking notes, so don't be surprised if I keep my head down for most of the stream. But what I say matters more than what you can see, at least. Um, so, let's, as always, let's give it a couple minutes. And then we'll get started. Let people enter the chat. It is a U.S. centric live stream, but if I do a video on USA 11 for Qatar, um, that'll probably be a separate video, like a regular video, not a live stream. Um, it's a good idea, though. I'll definitely consider it. Go Blue says he's not even sure that qualifiers will start in October. I hope they do, honestly, even if they have to be behind closed doors. But of course, at the end of the day, health and livelihood is more important. So if it's the best decision to not go forward with it, then it is what it is, right? Um, but until then, so far, the first round of World Cup qualifying for CONCACAF has been given the green light. And I think since most of these games are taking place in the Caribbean, last I heard the Caribbean's not getting hit with COVID as hard as continental North America. So maybe they'll be able to. Um, Africa, I believe, was also given the green light to go ahead with their World Cup qualifying in October. I think we're the only two confederations right now, North America and Africa, which honestly, I don't know if you guys have thought about this, but it's been on my mind a lot lately. Uh, Comnibal, South America, they are in a bit of trouble because they just postponed their qualifiers for October again. And you know how Comnibal is a very large table of home and away with all 10 associations. It's eight. They play 18 games, basically. That's how their format has been for decades now. Um, I, I wonder how they're going to be able to schedule 18 games in 2021 in addition to Copa America that's supposed to take place next summer. Uh, they're going to be playing a lot of international games. So will we next year because we're scheduled to play at least 15 calendar games but you know common bowl has the longest drawn out qualifying phase in the world they play more games than uh even though they're the smallest confederation they play the mo the most games of any confederation because you know the european continent and the african continent are divided into groups but this is one basically round round robin double round robin league table and uh that's got to be a nightmare, figuring out the scheduling for that and everything. Um, I wonder how they're going to do it. It may get to a point where it may get to a point where Common Bowl may have to use Copa America next year, at, at least partially, to uh, serve as a double for World Cup qualification. Not just 
Copa America, but integrate the Copa America into the qualifying phase because, you know, they'll ha- they're going to have 20 plus games uh, in total to play in just a year and a half. And that's a lot for an international team. You know, usually national sides don't play, but maybe 10 or 11 games a year, some even less. Um, so it's going to, it's going to be an organizational uh, challenge for them to figure out. Also the whole thing with Brazil too, because Brazil seems to have mishandled the whole COVID thing. Maybe Brazil's not going to be able to play any games at home. They might have to have all their uh, fixtures played at neutral venues or something. Which, if anyone can afford that and still qualify, it's Brazil. I mean, yeah. All right. So... Uh, let's get started. I'm already six minutes in, nine folks in the stream. It's a good number, especially for a, uh, a U.S. specific topic of the day. All right, guys, so look, um, to preface all this, I will say that the path for the U.S. to Qatar 2022 is not 100% known because we still don't know the identity of the three teams that will come out of the first two rounds and qualify for the octagonal. But um, we know more or less through the draw for the third round the, the what group winners the U.S. will be playing uh, if – on any given match date, if not the exact identity of the team. So as always, when we talk about stuff like this, I encourage you to pull up a Wikipedia page so it makes it easier to follow along with me. You hear a buzzing sound in the background. That's my AC unit. Sorry. Um, Wikipedia 2022 World Cup qualifying CONCACAF third round. Make sure it's third round specifically because that's what the octagonal is. And you can see here that winner of BE, winner of AF, and winner of CD are already been drawn into the uh, the scheduling. So now there are some concerns before I, I go match by match and I give a sort of a points projection of where I think the U.S. will ultimately end up as sort of like an early prediction. I want to say a few things. A lot of this is going to largely depend on um, injuries or lack thereof uh, pertaining to crucial players like Weston McKinney, Tyler Adams, Christian Pulisic. Um, Now, the good news on Pulisic's part is that even though he's injured now, he's only expected to miss five or six weeks of action, and the USA doesn't play qualifying games until another 10 months anyway, so that's not really much of a concern unless he were to come back, get re-injured during the club season, and then miss crucial qualifying games for us. Um, We have no way of knowing who will be in form, where all of our young prospects will be playing in 10 months' time, whether they'll get transfers or bigger deals to uh, uh, better clubs. Uh, We don't know exactly what the U.S.'s preparation games will be like in the build-up to qualification because we may or may not be having a, 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 some, some friendlies being played between now and next spring. Um, there are some sources that say the U.S. will play South Korea and Japan this fall. Some other sources saying that that's not really confirmed as of yet. As you know, we had some friendlies earlier this year against the Netherlands and Wales postponed, canceled, actually, because of the coronavirus. It's very possible that the U.S. plays just one or two friendlies to close out 2020 or doesn't play any friendlies at all. And then the next time we kick off being the Nations League semifinals, which are scheduled to take place in March. Now, if that happens, that would be a huge disappointment, potentially disastrous, because that would mean the U.S. will have gone 13 months over a year without playing a single game uh, under Greg Berhalter, and we would be jumping straight ahead 
wrapping up a competition that started in 2019 um, in the Nations League. So uh, the worst case scenario would be for the U.S. to be heading into World Cup qualifying with only the Nations League games playing uh, or just a few friendlies here or there, a really real uh, lack of adequate preparation. I hope that doesn't happen, but we we just don't know yet, right? So we have here, let's go through the schedule of the U.S. men's national team. Now, because of the unpredictability of, oh, yeah, there's one more thing I want to say, sorry. Because of the unpredictability, I can only predict project how the U.S. will do based off of the last time I saw the U.S., as well as using a little bit of intuition as to where um, our individual players are at with their respective clubs, um, and then just you know go from there. I can't account for any tinkering of lineups that Berhalter will do, whether he insists on a playing out the back system, whether his approach to this qualifying phase will entail playing the, the style of football that he wants to play or just getting results because there's been – going back to the second leg against Canada in Orlando where we thrashed them after that initial humiliation, Burhalter um, reverted to a uh, – a, a, he reverted back to playing the way where the U.S. just tries to get a result, and there's been a lot of pressure on him. There always has been a lot of pressure on him to just get us back to the World Cup. doesn't matter how flashy it looks just as long as we get there, but he's very, he's a very principled man. He is a football romantic. Uh, I don't know. I have doubts whether or not the U.S. is at an advanced stage right now where it can implement a playing out the back system the way that he wants to, but he is very much so uh, a romantic about that in that regard. Um He is a romantic. I mean, Le Alexi Lawless is right about that. He is. Uh, you have to call a spade a spade. You know, sometimes I don't like most of his takes, but his take on that one is correct. So I went back and I looked at the CONCACAF hexagonal for previous World Cup qualifying cycles, and the average number of points out of 30, because you're playing 10 games in total, home and away, the average number of points to get you across the finish line to qualify directly to put you in a safe position is roughly 15. You get 15 points, you're, you're going to finish in the top three of the hex. You'll avoid the playoff. However... There have been instances with with sides that have qualified with significantly less. Um, Mexico qualified in 2014, I believe, with 11 or 12 points going through to the playoff. Panama qualified with uh, 13 points four years ago. Um, so if you finish, it, and under that old format, if you finished with anywhere between 11 to 13 points, you could conceivably qualify directly, or you could get that, that lifeline through the um, through the playoff. And that just goes to show, guys, how even though the hex is not easy, it is very forgiving. It's very lenient because a team can screw up so much they can still make it to the World Cup. What's actually very interesting is that Mexico in 2014 did worse they did worse than the U.S. did in 2018, in 2017, excuse me, and they made it to the World Cup. I believe Mexico only won two or three out of ten games under Chepo de la Torre back in 2013. Just goes to show how out of form they were, right? Uh, so with the expansion to eight teams, that gives us seven games home, seven away for a total of 14 games. So the number of games we'll be playing has increased from 10 to 14, which means the maximum number of points you can get is 42, right? 14 times three. So what is the window that the U.S. would be, would, 
can reach to find itself in the safe zone to get a direct spot to Qatar 2022. I'm looking at the math. Uh, it's averaging at about anywhere between 19 to 23 points should be safe. Uh, that seems to be the sweet spot for the U.S., 19 to 23 points. Uh, anything lower than 19, the U.S. would probably either fall into the playoff spot or lower. Uh, because it's important to remember that usually the bottom two or three sides in the hex uh, finish in the single digits. This time, though, with more games, the teams that finish in the bottom three will probably crack. At least one of them, at least, will crack the double digits. Um, but the U.S. really should be aiming for, for 19 to 23 points. So now with all that said, 16 minutes in, let me crack, let me jump right into the schedule. So. In June of 2021, the United States will open up its, heck, its octagonal campaign away from home. We're going to be playing on the road against the winner of Group A versus the winner of Group F from the previous rounds. That's looking extremely likely to be either El Salvador or Trinidad and Tobago. Now, I know what you're thinking. We start off World Cup qualifying on the road in Trinidad. You can already feel the narratives coming, right? The last game, the last qualifying game we played that ended in disaster on a rainy night in Trinidad. So does begin the next cycle. Probably in that same venue, in that same stadium in Port of Spain. Or Cuva, actually. It was in Cuva. Yes, it was Cuva. We, we played C-O-U-V-A. Um, that would be, I think, a very emotional game. For the U.S., uh, a game very much so in which the side would play with a chip on its shoulder, um, and one in which we will head into with the expectation being a win to right that uh, embarrassment from, from October 2017. Now, folks will point to the Gold Cup result where we thrashed Trinidad last year 6-0, but if, that, if this were to happen in our first game, Anything short of a victory would be seen as a poor start to the campaign. However, guys, I don't think that's where we're going to be. I think it's going to be El Salvador, and we're going to be going to Estadio Cuscatlan in San Salvador. Um, and that, hey, Central America, tough away games, whether it's Honduras, Costa Rica, Panama. Central America is always hostile environment for the U.S. men's national team when we go away. However, and you'll see why as we get toward the end of the schedule and you see who the U.S. plays closing out the series where our schedule gets tougher, it's imperative for the U.S. to get off to a winning start regardless of who they play away from home, whether it's Trinidad or El Salvador. Uh, and if El, El Salvador qualifies for the octagonal, they will likely be they will likely be the worst team in the octagonal, at least in my view. Um, because if you're looking at Canada and Panama making it, in addition to the five who already get an automatic buy to the octagonal, you you need to get off to a winning start against El Salvador. I don't think you can drop points that early on. Um, that'll be a tough game. I think that even though El Salvador will be at home, they're a side that is that plays very defensively. And I think that that's a game where the U.S. will hog possession and seek to break them down. I'm gonna go with a. I'm gonna go with a one nil victory for the U.S. I think it'll be a hard, slugged, um, rugged match. I'm going with the U.S. to win that game, uh, the opener, against El Salvador. The next match we would have would be scheduled also for June. Remember, we're playing four games in June of 2021. And look, the second game is also against a team that will come through the first couple of rounds. So the first two matches the U.S. plays are absolutely imperative for us to get if not six points, then at least four points. Four points would be permissible because 
theoretically speaking, we'd be, we would be playing against two of the weakest teams in the octagonal, t- two teams that will have come from the previous round, right? And it's looking like that will be the winner of Group B versus E, which will be either Canada or Haiti. Canada, we would be playing at home to either Canada or Haiti. So if Canada and Haiti win their groups in the first round, which they are by far and away favored to do, um, who would I favor to come through that in order to be the team that the U.S. plays? I think, I think it's going to be Canada, guys. I know that Haiti beat Canada in the Gold Cup, but I think Canada is going through a sort of a revolution right now. This is the best squad, the most promising squad they've had in about 20 years. Um, Jonathan David, Alfonso Davies, uh, Junior Hoylet. Um, I think they still have Atiba Hutchinson. He's a veteran of the squad. He's still there. So this Canadian side is confident. They're full of belief. They think they, they can make a real impact in qualification. And I do think that will be who the U.S. will play in our second game. Um, Scoreline prediction for that. Well, look, um, Canada is going to be a very tricky side because they upset us in the Nations League in BC Palace uh, in Vancouver, I believe it was, last October 2-0 before we turned it around in Orlando a month later. It's a game that the U.S. is going to have to be very weary, but it's one where the U.S. should feel reasonably, um, I wouldn't say confident, but believe that it can get through that because it should. we should get through that. So I'm going to go with a victory here for the U.S. and nothing emphatic. I'm going to. It's going to be a two to one, a two to one win. And right off the bat, against El Salvador and Canada, two teams that are not seated, that are not seated for the octagonal. Believe it or not, the last time around when uh, we started World Cup qualifying, we registered two losses which led to the firing of Klinsman when we lost to Mexico and Costa Rica. I actually think the U.S. is going to get off to a good start. I'm not being biased. I'm just looking at the schedule and trying to look at it as objectively as possible because if we don't beat the likes of El Salvador and Canada, it spells doom later on against Mexico, Jamaica, Costa Rica. So... Where the last time around we got zero points after two games, I genuinely do think it's going to be six points from the first two games. Now, here's where I'm going to have to diverge a little bit. The next game after that in June would be away to Honduras at San Pedro Sula. For those of you that are familiar with uh, road games in CONCACAF, San Pedro Sula is probably the the second most uncomfortable away venue for the U.S. to play in after the Estadio Azteca in Mexico City. I think the USA is going to lose this match. Honduras have been through a sort of um, a stagnant phase of late. They didn't do so well in the last couple of CONCACAF Gold Cups, but this is one in where I think the U.S. is going to hit a stumbling block and this we actually should have lost to them we should have lost to them in the last time we played them in san pedro sula but if not for uh, a poor clearance from the Honduran back line that led to bobby wood netting a very much so undeserved equalizer for us to give us a sort of a lifeline uh, i think honduras is going to win this game this is and and think about it. San Pedro Sula in general sweltering conditions. This is going to be at the height of June. It's an awful awful time of year to be playing in Honduras. So yeah, I I'm, I think we'll lose that match. Um, will we get thumped? No. Uh, we'll lose that game two to one. A two to one win for Honduras. So moving on. Now, the last game we play in June 2021, which is the window where we play the most games in any one given month, right? The last game for June 2021 is going to be at home against Jamaica. 
at home against Jamaica. A little bit of history between the U.S. and Jamaica in the last few years or so. They beat us at the in the, in the semifinals of the 2015 Gold Cup under manager Theodore Whitmore, who's still at the helm right now. Um, we beat them, got a little bit of revenge a couple of years later in the final of the 2017 Gold Cup. They beat us right on the eve of 2019 uh, through a, a wonder strike by Shabar Nicholson just before the last Gold Cup last summer, before we rebounded and beat them in the semifinals of that tournament, three goals to one. So it's kind of been like a back and forth here. I'm almost tempted to go ahead and say Jamaica, who I rate very highly in the region, to get a result here. But because we're playing at home, I think – see, Jamaica has a serious squad this time around in this cycle. Um, we're playing at home. I think that game is most likely going to be played in either the Pacific Northwest or in the Northeast – I'm going to give the U.S. a win there, and I'll say it's going to be a mm, maybe two nil, a two nil win. But it's going to be a difficult game. But if because we're playing at home, I think we should win that match. So after June of 2021, where where do I think the U.S. is going to be sitting? I think we're going to be on nine points out of twelve from three wins. And one loss. I think that's reasonable, right? Um, then we will move on to September 2021, where we will go away. We will go away from home and play the winner of Group C versus Group D. Now, Group C and Group D from the previous rounds, it's looking like it's either going to be Panama or Curacao. Based on Based on more heightened pedigree in CONCACAF football, I do think Panama will come through that, although it'll be very interesting if the U.S. actually does end up meeting a Curacao team under the tutelage of Gus Hiddink. I think that'd be really cool to watch. I do think it's going to be Panama. And if we go away to Panama City, the U.S. has a relatively decent record in Panama City. but I, So I think it's going to be a draw. I think that match will be a draw. Um, based on historical trends, we struggle the most in Honduras, Costa Rica, and Mexico, but not so much in Panama, Guatemala, Nicaragua. Now, of course, historical trends l exist largely for the purpose of being upended, right? And just because something happens in one cycle doesn't mean that it's going to happen repeatedly um but that game will be a draw i believe in panama I will, will, and i'm gonna go with a one one so after five games that would put us at 10 points out of a possible 15 do i sound like i'm being too biased i hope i'm not being too biased i think 10 points out of 15 is uh reasonable right that'll be a draw then after that, we play at home in September 2021 to Costa Rica. The U.S. playing at home versus Costa Rica. We actually lost to them twice in uh, the last qualifying phase. They beat us at home 4-0, and they beat us on the road 2-0. I was uh, just a few blocks outside the stadium when that happened because it happened near my, uh, my hometown here in New Jersey. Um, as I've stated previously on this channel, I don't think that Costa Rica, well, I don't think a lot of the Central American teams this phase are as strong as they were in previous cycles. Um, ever since the 2018 World Cup ended, both the likes of Costa Rica and Panama have gone through managerial changes. They've gone through player retirees, um, Costa Rica has, on average, one of the oldest squads. I looked this up in the CONCACAF region. Um, if we're playing at home, if we're playing at home in this game, I'm going to say we'll beat Costa Rica. The last few times that we've played Costa Rica in a competitive environment, um, in home games, 
I believe we've won three out of four of those meetings. So, for example, 2016 Copa America Centenario, 2017 Gold Cup semifinals. We lost to them in World Cup qualifying in September of 2017 in Harrison, New Jersey. And then I believe we beat them twice in the Burhalter era um, in friendlies, both in, um, I think we played out in Carson City, Nevada. And uh, where did we play in February? Well, where was that game in February we played? It was somewhere in the U.S. I don't remember. But, yeah, I mean, Costa Rica is going through the works at the moment. So are we. But I'm going to go with a victory here. Now, if this was an away game, I'll be honest with you. If this was an away game, I don't see us winning that just because it's a... Um, it's Costa Rica and San Jose. So I think we'll win, but still, I think we'll win this match. Um, and to be honest, I'm thinking maybe a two to one or maybe, yeah, maybe a two to one win. So that would take the U.S. to about 13 points out of a possible 18. 13 out of 18. Now, after that, we play Mexico in October of 2021, over a year from now. And this game is also at home. It's not going to be away. So this is going to be the first series of games, two games in a row, where, where we'll, yeah, we will be playing at home. And um, this is really hard. 1-1 one, one is realistic for which one? The match against Costa Rica or the Mexico game? Which one are you refer referring to? <sighs> Can I be honest with you? I, I, I mean, we could lose both of these games, which would be a complete nightmare. We'd lose both games to Mexico, um, home and away. Which would suck because uh, it would suck because we've already lost twice to them. I think under Berhalter we lost in the Gold Cup final, and we lost in that friendly last September, right? So to be honest with you, unless something changes, guys, I got to give this to Mexico here. Mexico will win this match. Where will this game be played? Probably I would anticipate either in Columbus, Ohio, or somewhere in Portland or Seattle, but Mexico under Tata Martino is um, they're, just on a, they're just on a different wavelength at the moment, so I'm going to go with the, a loss here to Mexico. I think we'll lose that match, even though we'll be at home going with the loss. So that would still keep us at 13 points from a possible 21. Moving on to how many games is that so far? Are we halfway there already? One, two, three, four, five, six. Yeah, okay. So at the halfway point. At the halfway point, I have with, with, with seven games played out of 14, uh, I have the U.S. on 13 points out of a possible 21 with a record of three wins, one draw, and two losses. I think that's fairly reasonable. So moving on to the second half of the qualifying phase, which would take place in uh, also hmm, in October of 2021. The U.S. goes away from home to play Jamaica at the office. That's a tough game. That's a very tough game to go to Kingston away. Well, I'll say this. Since we're playing Mexico and Jamaica consecutively back-to-back, -back, I think we're going to lose one of those games. I don't think we're going to lose both of them. So I'm going to go with a draw in that match against Jamaica at the office. We could conceivably lose that if I'm being honest. Um, but I'm going to go with a draw. 
And I'm going to go with a a nil-nil draw, actually. I think that'll be scoreless, and it'll be a really very ugly game. Now, if we lose that match, um, I wouldn't hit the panic button just yet because there's still a long way to go yet. But it would be a little bit worrisome, right? In November of 2021, so wait, that would take us to what? 14? 14 points out of 24 so far. The next match after that would be at home against the winner of AF, which, as I said earlier, I think the winner of Group A is going to be El Salvador. That should be a victory right there. Should be getting six points on El Salvador. I'll go as far as to say if the U.S. Pl pl plays El Salvador in that November game, we'll win that match by three or four goals. I think it'll pr be a strong performance, uh, and I'll go with uh, I'll go with a uh, four nil, which will probably be the, the U.S.'s best performance throughout the entire qualifying campaign. That would take us to seventeen points. Seventeen points. Then that would be the – okay, we have one more game in 2021. Then we would go away to play Canada. We go away to play Canada. That would be a tough game. What do you guys think that would happen? That's a tough one. I don't know. I can't predict that, to be honest. I'm going to say a draw. Yeah, I'm going to say a draw. 1-1 one, one draw because that embarrassment to uh, to them last October, that'll be on, the, that'll be on their minds. Um, so 18 points. And that will close out 2021. That will close out the year 2021, and the U.S. will have 18 points. Now, remember what I said. The sweet spot to qualify directly is, on average, is likely going to be anywhere between 19 to 23 points. So the U.S. in relatively decent position, I would say, um, just going off of this, uh, this schedule right here. 18 points at the end of 2021. At that point, we would probably need about another four or five points to qualify directly to avoid the playoffs with um, six games five, or five games remaining, excuse me. So heading into January 2022, heading into January of 2022, we have a home game against Honduras. Okay. Okay. We almost always beat Honduras at home here in the U.S. I can't remember the last time we ever didn't beat them at home. So I think we'll win that match. And it'll be 3-1. I think we'll win that one by a couple of goals. Three goals to one. That would take us to 21 points. Possibly putting us on the cusp of qualifying what do you guys think? Yeah, 21 points. And then the next game after that, also in January of 2022, will be away to Mexico at the Estadio Azteca. It's going to be a loss, guys. <laughs> That's going to be a loss. Um I don't know what the scoreline will be, but it's it, that'll be a loss. 2-0. A 2-0 loss for the U.S. That'll still keep us at 21 points, though. Um, and then heading into the final two match days in March. We have... Oh, 
our last game at home, which will be against the winner of CD, which according to the paper here would be Panama. Home game against Panama. I think we win that match. Um, not comfortably, but we get the job done. We win that game, I'll say, 1-0. The reason I say 1-0 is because at that point, I would imagine Panama or Curaçao, whoever we play, will be that they'll be at the end of their campaign as well, and they're going to be fighting for points as the qualifying season wraps up, especially if they're still alive at that point. So I'm going with a 1-0 win over Panama there. And with 24 points right there, just circled it, that should be enough to qualify with a game to spare. So... If this is correct, the projection that I have here is for the U.S. to qualify for the 2022 World Cup in March of 2022 on the ninth match day with one game to spare. That's what I have here because 24 points would be enough to, uh, to break the, the points threshold into getting a direct spot at Qatar. And then we would have one final away game to... I believe Costa Rica, which I think the U.S. loses that, to be honest. I think the U.S. would lose that match narrowly, though, two to one. So, yeah, let me see. Let me go through here at, at the overall record. One, two. Let me see. So one, two, three, four, five, six, seven wins. Seven wins out of 14. How many draws do we have here? Let me check. One, two, Three draws and four losses. Now, what will that look like on a table? Like, how would that manifest on a table with 24 points in an eight team double round robin? Um, with 24 points, I think that would put the US. I think we could finish second in the table uh, just because of the, the other Central American teams picking points off each other. Um, so the record I, with after 14 matches, I have, yeah, seven wins, three draws, four losses. I was kind of teetering back and forth between four draws and three losses instead like switch the number of the law draws and losses, but seven wins regardless. So if we have a 50% win rate, so 50% of matches won, seven out of 14, and then the other 50% being divided over losses and draws, um, that just should still be enough for us to qualify for the World Cup. And to keep things humble and to keep expectations tempered the u.s qualifying on the penultimate match day mean which means the second to last match day i think that's uh the cautious estimate right there um now what's the earliest that the u.s could qualify well it depends on if we can get a road victory against one of the uh one of the big Central American sides. Um, so, for example, if we able if we're able to go to Panama City and get three points, or if we're able to pull off a slight upset in San Pedro Sula, maybe the U.S. could qualify with eight match days. I mean, um, with um, twelve match days done instead of fourteen. But I mean, a lot of that really depends, right? Um, and you know, a lot of it depends also on how close the other teams are next to you in uh, proximity in the table. 
So, yeah, I think 24. This is not the first time that I wrote all this down. I, I usually prepare this kind of stuff before I start streams, and then I you know, do it in real time with you guys. But for some reason, uh, in a 42-point in a 42 point uh, possibility i'm seeing the i'm seeing the us cracking about 24 or 25 um, anything more than that would be a bonus now let me get to your questions here i know you guys have submitted a lot of questions I wanted to be really mean. I wanted to be really mean and say we're going to go to Canada and beat them away, but <laughs> it's a pretty decent Canadian side. So, um, but let's see. So, uh, Sutton Explorer asks, "Do you think Mexico will get a clean sweep with fourteen wins?" No, but I think Mexico is going to go undefeated. That's a, a sub prediction. If you want, oh, you guys want general predictions for the octagonal? Um, yeah, I think Mexico is going to go undefeated. I don't see Mexico losing a, a game. Uh, the best oper the best chance that they could, you know, lose. Well, the best. Um, how can I say? The games where they would be most susceptible to losing. I guess would be away probably to Costa Rica or possibly at the office in Kingston. Um, but I've got Mexico going undefeated. And I mean, if they get 42 points, that would be historic, right? 40 <laughs> Mexico getting 42 points would be a huge statement. They might become the first team in the world to qualify for the World Cup. That happens because if Mexico gets 14 wins, they would probably wrap up qualification by the match day 10 or something like that, right? Match day 10 out of 14. So, yeah. What do you guys think? Is Mexico going to go undefeated? Let's see. I mean, what, what other questions we have here? Yeah. Well, Somebody asked in the comment section, what away games worry you the most? The away games that worry me the most are San Pedro Sula and uh, Me Mexico City. Those are the two games on the road that I'm worried about most. But I think also the um, away at the office, which is – that's the name of the national stadium of uh, in, in Kingston, uh, Jamaica. That's going to be also very difficult – away game um, well who do I think will qualify along with USA and Mexico I mean a lot of that I'd have to go through match by match and predict, but um, I'll just say that I'm quite bullish, which means I'm, I have a feeling 
I have a good feeling that uh, the reggae boys are going to make a very big case for qualification, even if they slightly miss out. Um, because they've been causing us a lot of problems the last few years. They've been causing Mexico problems, too. <laughs> I think they beat Mexico once or twice. Um, I don't think... Well, El Salvador is not going to have enough to make it. I don't think Honduras is going to have enough either. Skeptical about Panama making it back as well. So that third direct spot is likely going to be between Canada... Jamaica, and who's the other team? Costa Rica. And on paper, on paper, just because of history, Costa Rica would probably be the favorite, but they're not looking so hot lately. So Canada could very well make it back to the World Cup. Um, what I think is going to happen, like you just asking me straight out just a gut feeling what I think is going to happen. Canada is going to come very close. Um, they may even get the playoff spot and then lose to the team from Asia. So, hold on. It's okay. Yeah. Okay. Sorry about that. My <laughs> my dog was trying to come in the room and she couldn't make up her mind whether or not she was like staying in the doorway or not. <laughs> She's gonna be fifteen this year. My dog's turning 15 in November, but she's uh, still pretty healthy. I take good care of her, take her for walks, everything. Um, anyway, yes, I, I, uh, Sutton, Sutton Explorer is right. Canada is in with a very, very serious shot of qualifying for the World Cup. Um, but what I think is going to happen is I think they're going to get they're they're going to get agonizingly close. And then they'll miss out, and then that will serve as, as a sort of narrative for 2026 when they qualify directly as host. And then I think they'll, they'll have a breakout tournament that year. But um, if Canada does not finish in the top three, they could very well get the playoff spot. Um, but I got to be honest with you guys, it breaks my heart. I hate saying this because CONCACAF is my favorite confederation. So I hate saying this, but I think the fourth place team from the region is going to lose the international playoff to either Asia or South America. And we're only going to spend three. We're only going to send three teams to the, uh, to the World Cup again. I hate saying it, but that's what I see happening. How do you see USA doing at the World Cup? You know, that's, um, that's a good prediction. I probably share the same thing as you do. Third, third place in the, in the group stage. Um, one good thing about the U.S. men's national teams in recent World Cups is that whenever we get there, we tend, at least not since 1998, we tend to not get blown out. So, I mean, a third-place finish in the group stages with, like, one or two points sounds pretty, pretty up there with this squad. Well, then again, we did lose to the Czech Republic 
in 06, we were completely outclassed by uh, <laughs> Pavel Nedved and uh, the likes of Kohler and Uchvalusi and that golden generation Czech team. But that was a very good Czech team. I was in middle school. We were watching the match in our in the auditorium. That game, the game could have been a lot uglier for us. Um, so it also depends on the group we get. Imagine if the U.S. gets drawn with like, I don't know, let's say Brazil, and then a pot two team that has a team that should be in pot one because we know the FIFA rankings are weird. So imagine we get a group like Brazil, Spain, and uh, Senegal. <laughs> if that's like the group the U.S. gets, I'm afraid, boys, it's it's going to be a uh, it's going to be a goose egg <laughs> with zero points. Uh, Mark Paselli says, why do you think CONCACAF will lose to the AFC? Well, usually the intercontinental playoffs is on a rotational basis, isn't it? It, it goes between like CONCACAF will play the Asian team and then the South American team and then the Oceanian team. We play the Oceanian team, a.k.a. New Zealand, because, because, because New Zealand. Then... We have a good shot of sending four teams to the to the World Cup. If we play against South America, I mean, if if a, if a Concacaf team plays against South America, then South America is going to send five teams to the World Cup, no matter what, right? Um, if we play against an Asian team, it would be a I think a toss up, but slightly favored for the Asian team because this is a World Cup that's going to be held on Asian soil. And if you look at World Cups geographically, the continent in which it's played on matters. And I think once the the World Cup takes place in, in Qatar in 2022, Asia as a whole is going to have a little bit of a boost. Naturally, right? Um, so in a CONCACAF versus Asia playoff for a World Cup held in Asia, it it, it would just feel like the zeitgeist would, would be, the energy would be going to, I sound like a superstitious uh, person. If it, it seems like it would, it would favor Asia, if you get what I mean. And, you know, I, I, pr I predicted Australia to beat Honduras in the playoff four years ago, right? There was an Asia versus CONCACAF playoff uh, for Russia 2018, and um, Australia beat Honduras. Okay, that's a fair point, Mark Baselli. 2002, the World Cup was hosted in AFC, and Iran lost the playoff. Thing is, they lost the playoff to who? They lost it to the Republic of Ireland. They lost it to a very good Republic of Ireland side. That was the same Irish team the last time they qualified for the World Cup that also tied group Germany in the group stages and lost to, to uh, Spain on penalties in the round of 16. So that was a, a very decent Irish team. Uh, we, we would get smacked. How would the U.S. do in qualification if they were in any other confederation? Um, well, the U.S. right now, as the team is right now, gets smacked in Europe. <sighs> how many groups, how many teams are usually in a qualifying group in, in Europe? Like five or six teams? The U.S. probably finishes in like fourth position. Like maybe third position at best, but not even enough to go to a playoff. Definitely not even enough to go to a playoff. Um, Africa would not qualify. No. 
would not qualify. Asia, would the U.S. would the U.S. qualify from Asia? Hmm. Maybe, but it would be close, wouldn't it? Right. Maybe. The U.S. would at least be in contention in Asia for sure, but. Yeah, both. Asia would be a toss up. So, uh, in short, Europe would be hell no. South America would be hell no. Africa would be likely not. Asia would be a toss up. Oceania would be, yeah, of course. <laughs> Do you know the new format for the UEFA World Cup qualifying? I I don't know the new format. I'd have to check into that. Uh, how confident are you the U.S. men's national team will qualify for the World Cup? About about sixty five percent. About 65%. Uh, let's see. What, any other questions? Yeah, guys, any other questions you have? Yeah, Rosicky scored a really good goal. Weston McKenney to Juve. Thoughts? It's great, right? It's it's wonderful to see young Americans getting playing time in uh in big European clubs. I mean, Pulisic going to Chelsea that was that was really big, and the impact that he's had there. Uh, he's already the best American player of all time, Christian Pulisic. Um, Tyler Adams at RB Leipzig scored a very crucial goal against Atleti. That was a good day. I mean, when you're from a, a country that doesn't have it as your main sport and you're kind of like in its infancy, any of that is uh, seen as a victory. So, I mean, Weston going to Juve, is, it's cool. Juve is an old school club. They're European royalty. Juventus is European royalty. So feels good, man. Yeah, I saw that. If Mexico qualify with 42 points, would you consider them going far in the World Cup? Not necessarily, because form in World Cup qualification does not necessarily portend how a team is going to do in the World Cup. Um, if you remember Mexico, by the skin of their teeth, in a very bad off season, they qualified for Brazil, and um, they did really well once the World Cup turned around. I can give you another example: Uruguay barely qualified for South Africa; they got to the semifinals. Had their defending been a little bit better, they they might have gotten past the Dutch in that semi to get to the final. So, you know how a team is in in qualifying. It, it, I wouldn't say it has no bearing on their World Cup performance, but one thing that I always say on this channel and that you can quote me on is six months is a long time in football, so it doesn't necessarily mean that they would have a deep run in Qatar. Uh, 
favorite U.S. men's national team player, Clint Dempsey. It's always been Clint Dempsey. It's always gonna. It's always gonna be Clint Dempsey. Um, the breakthrough he had when he was at a, uh, I think it was Everton. Um, it really helped put him and Landon Donovan both really helped put U.S. on the map internationally, and um, he always approached every game with a proper fighting spirit and probably the grittiest player in U.S. men's national team history. So I've always loved Clint Dempsey for that reason. Um, but not the best player, but he would be my favorite. Of course, of course, he's he's better than than Claudio Reyna. I mean, and there's no shame in admitting that, right? Christian Pulisic, talent wise, just in in raw, Pulisic is already the best thing to ever come out of the U.S. <laughs> and there's more dignity in just admitting that than to. Deny it. <laughs> Do you think Ukraine can reach the semifinals of the World Cup? Listen, man. Turkey did it in 2002. Croatia got to the final in, in Russia. Um, crazier things have happened, you know, um, the world cup is full of unconventional sides reaching the, the last four, you know, I know that was a very strong Bulgarian outfit back in the nineties under with, uh, Stoikov. They still were not expected to get to the semis. So yeah, of course, Ukraine can get to a world cup semifinal. It just depends on their trajectory. It just depends on a whole bunch of shit. You know, they got to the quarterfinals back in 2006, right? Their first and only ever appearance as an independent nation, Ukraine got to the quarters under, I think their manager was Oleg Blokhin at the time. And they had players like Anatoly Timoshuk, uh, Rotan, um, Shevchenko as a player. So, you know, yeah, of course they can. I mean, yeah, as far as Alfonso Davies goes, you can already make a case that he might be the best left back in the world right now. And if not the best, he's, he's up there, right? So good for Canada to have a player like him. I don't know if uh, well, uh, hmm. I don't know if I would go so far as to say he's the best left back, but <laughs> if he isn't already, he's making a very serious statement for it in the next couple of years. Oh, for, of course. Nathan Trudchill asks a very good question: Do you still take pride in drawing with Italy? In the 2006 group stage, absolutely. <laughs> Are you kidding with me? Like that, we had no business drawing against that Italian side with uh, well-drilled Andrea Pirlo, Buffon, Gattuso, Totti, um, Cannavaro. <laughs> you, I, I don't care if it was an own goal. I take that to the bank any day of the week. Plus. It was the only team, the only team to not lose to the Italians that year. 
in that tournament, if you, unless you want to count France uh, in the final with the penalty shootout thing. But, yeah. But see, that's one of the most frustrating things about the U.S. in a World Cup, right? Is this tendency to sometimes, <laughs> through sheer stubbornness, play to the level of their opponent <laughs> and then play down to the level of the opponent against opposition that on paper, but, um, but you know, I mean, 2010 world cup, we also got very lucky. Robert green gave Robert green gave the U S a big helping hand with that howler. Uh, but we almost bottled the game against Algeria and we almost bottled that game against Slovenia as well. So, you know, No, there's no breathing space for Costa Rica. Costa Rica is a footballing mad country. They have, especially in the CONCACAF region, a long-standing footballing tradition. Probably the second longest in the entire confederation behind Mexico. There's no breathing space. Costa Rica always expects to qualify for the World Cup, and whenever they don't qualify, it's, it's seen as an, a complete failure. Um, I know a couple of Costa Ricans who... After 2010, missing out in South Africa, they were devastated. And then Brazil 2014, when the Ticos had a breakout tourney, getting to the last eight, they were, you know, on cloud nine. So Costa Rica always expects to be at the World Cup. So there's no breathing space for them. They, they don't make it it's seen as a, uh, a big disappointment. They're not Guatemala, they're not Nicaragua, they're not Belize, they're Costa Rica. Did you think the U.S. could have gone on to win the final group game against after that Italy game? What was that one against Ghana? Maybe. But that Ghana team also beat the Czech Republic. And Ghana at the time was a relatively unknown force. But they surprised a lot of folks, and they got to the uh, the next round on six points. You know, so not necessarily. All right, guys, I think we're going to do about five more minutes. I'm going to wrap this up. No, you don't want me coaching anything, trust me. Will Zlatan return to Sweden? Has he voiced a uh, a desire to do so? I haven't heard that. I think they seem to be doing just as fine without him, haven't they? The best and worst result in U.S. men's national team history. Um, well, the worst one, it still has to be that Trinidad loss, just because of the implications and the um, what it entailed missing out on the World Cup. 
for the first time since uh, 1986. That was a bad night. I remember making the video right after the match. I, I still couldn't believe it. So that and... Hmm. What was another low point for us? Finishing dead last, 32nd out of 32nd uh, in the final standings of the 98 World Cup was also pretty bad. And the reason that was really bad was because coming coming off of the, um, the 94 World Cup on home soil, where the U.S. actually did better than expected, there were high hopes heading into... That, uh, that World Cup. Um, and we just got thumped out in last place with zero points. And that included a, a two to one loss in a very politically charged game against Iran. Fun fact US lost to Iran in the 1998 World Cup. Um, Those are among the worst results, I would say. The best result in U.S. men's national team history. I would say the 2-0 win over Mexico in the round of 16 of Korea-Japan because it was the birth of the Dos Acero phenomenon. And also, it got us to a quarterfinal of a... Of a fucking World Cup. I mean, 1930 exists, but come on. Can you really count 1930? You can't count 1930. <laughs> Nobody really. Some other results. Um, that 1-1 one, one draw against England was really important. And so was the subsequent last gasp goal in stoppage time against Algeria to send us to the, the knockout phase. Now, those are among the most important. But as far as the best results, yeah, I, I would put them up there as long, much as long with yeah, along with uh, the uh, the best results. I think once we also beat Brazil in a friendly back in like 1993. Um, that was also another one. I'm trying to think of more. Yes, that Confederations Cup result. How can I be so stupid to forget that? Yeah, Devonta's right. <laughs> Beating Spain in the 2009 Confederations Cup. That was that was crazy. You know that was the span. That was the height of the Spanish dynasty. Spain was on a 15 game unbeaten streak, and Spain had lost one match out of 35 fixtures between. 2008 and 2012, I believe. And Bob Bradley lined up a very conservative 4-4-2, but really <laughs> the way that our wingbacks operated, it was more like a 5-3-2 formation. And it worked. And you know what's actually very interesting about that match? I'm glad Devonta mentioned it is when Switzer you guys remember when Switzerland beat um, Spain a year later that the manager of Switzerland at the time Otmar Hitzfeld said that the way that Switzerland approached that match he took notes from that semifinal the Confederations Cup no, I'm not bullshitting you. Go look that up on Wikipedia. <laughs> that was the inspiration for it. And I think Switzerland also in that game, they 
they fielded a 4-4-2 as well. So that was really big. So I'm just thinking like a lot of matches are running through my head. Uh, yeah, that Confederations Cup semi against Spain was like, what the, what the hell? Let's scroll through here. I'm reading the comments. Solid, but they always choke. Yes, I know the U.S. beat England in 1950, but counting results that happened more than half a century ago is kind of like cheating because the, the game is totally different today compared to what it was in 1950 and especially 1930. So I didn't want to count that because it's like, come on, you know. Uh, how would U.S. do in a mini league tournament with? The Nordic nations, Finland, Sweden, Denmark, Norway, Faroe Islands, Iceland, Greenland. Probably finish. How many teams is that? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Uh, probably finish fifth ahead of the Faroes and, and Greenland. Maybe fourth can finish ahead against Iceland, depending on a few things, but um, fourth or fifth position on a seventh. USA versus England, the men's teams play and the women's team play each other once. What is the aggregate score? Oh, leave, leave it to Sutton Explorer asking all the fun questions tonight. Um... An aggregate score, USA, men's, and women's team play. So what exactly is your question asking? You're asking if, if the men's team plays against the women's team? Or if the men's team play against each other and then the women's team plays against each other. Just so that I'm, we're clear that I understand what you're asking. And yeah, yeah, that's a fair point. I mean, Eng England won 1966 World Cup. Okay, so men men against each other, women's against each other. Uh, well, for the women's, I think that would be a pretty cool tight match, three goals to two for the U.S. And then for the men's, uh, I think England would win that match. Let's say, let's say four one. Yeah, I'll say four one. Maybe we'll, maybe we'll get a goal, but so on aggregate. That would be what? Six to four for England, which is actually not as bad as I thought it would be for us. I was thinking it was going to be something ridiculous like two to nine 
on aggregate. So I'll go with a four one win four to one win for England in the men's and then a three two win for the women's, the US women over England. So England takes that six four in aggregate. If I counted that correctly. Yeah. Or maybe England wins the men's matchup 5-0 or 6-0 and yeah who knows By the way, that 4-1 scoreline against the three Lions is kind of being generous to the U.S. because that match could easily be 5-0 instead of 4-1. But I, I, I would hope maybe like on a set piece, like a corner or something, we would have one goal in us maybe. <laughs> No, come on. We wouldn't lose 10 nil. I hope not. Not 10 nil. Hey, uh, that's a video you would do. Do you think England did well at the 2018 World Cup? Um, yeah, of course. Look, the thing with World Cup draws is that you can only beat what's put in front of you. And if you want to hold if you want to hold playing against Tunisia and Panama against England, that's unfair because England didn't ask to get in that group. They you only can play whoever is, comes your way. Right. So of course, England did well in that world cup. And I've said on this channel before, England should have gotten to the final. They, they blew that lead against Croatia, you know, you could give Croatia all the credit in the world for how they stormed back in all those knockout stage games, but England also, I think, after they went ahead through Chippier's uh, Chippier's free kick, they really kind of in extra, later on in extra time shot themselves in the foot. Um, that final and Southgate knows it too. Southgate knows that. England should have been in that final. Um, and I think they would have given France a very difficult game. Yeah, they lost three games, but they lost twice to Belgium. And Belgium is one of the best teams in the world. Belgium finished with uh, the bronze medal. So it's not like they lost to some Sunday pub team. <laughs> France England was France England would have been a really good final I think and I really I think England could have given France a better game than Croatia did so yeah CONCACAF teams, the managers in a Royal Rumble. Who wins? Ooh. <laughs> I got to go with my, my friend Theodore Whitmore for Jamaica. The guy as a, uh, as a player was completely stacked. And the way he stands on the sidelines during whenever they line up all stoically doesn't respond doesn't act emotional to everything i think he would be a resounding favorite let me see here
some way from here. Just put the rear end here. Just reading the comments. One moment. Yeah, sure. Josie Altador. Josie Altador, definitely. Have you seen him angry? He's scary. He's absolutely terrifying when he's angry. This is his temper, which is not common. Josie Altador gets in gets in your face and he looks like he's about to cut your head off. <laughs> so I would say Josie Altador. Yeah, Josie Altador wins a USMNT Royal Rumble. Uh, and Theodore Whitmore wins a CONCACAF Managers Royal Rumble. Okay, guys, we're going to do about two more minutes. I'm going to wrap up. This live stream is getting longer than I anticipated. Um, it's not late here. It's only 8.50. But I imagine for some of you it's getting late. And uh, I don't want to keep you. So, I am a strange person. I think we're all strange, don't we? How far do you think England will go in Euro 2021? I have them in the final. So Another Halloween video for Clowns FC. Is that what you guys want? No, I'm in the I'm in a garage. I'm currently in the garage. Or you call it garage. Right? A garage. This is where I make most of my videos just because it's usually where I get space, like free time. Because my, my room is small. You know what I mean? The Clowns FC Halloween video, another one of them. Well, I had I'd have to uh, come up with what to talk about in that one. Argentina hasn't played anything in the last. Argentina hasn't played anything in the last few months, so. How would you rate Portugal right now? Are they still top five in the world? I think so, yes. Um, the 2019 UEFA Nations League version of Portugal I thought was a stronger, more well-rounded side than the one that won the Euros four years ago. Can't believe it's been four years. Wow. Um, and they have, they have a couple of promising talents in the last couple of years coming up through the ranks. They have uh, Gonzalo Guedes. They have that 
that one guy, Jao Felix. Um, CR7's on the cusp of breaking the international goals record. I think he has 99 right now. It's still it's still a very solid team. Portugal, Fernando Santos as manager, improved upon that performance from 2016 in the European Championship because they, they did it kind of lacklusterly in France, but the way that they performed in the Nations League uh, final phase they were the host nation, so that probably gave them a little bit of a boost. But that version of Portugal, I thought, was a better version of themselves from the previous one. And, you know, the, the Portugal that we saw in the 2018 World Cup, they were in a difficult group. And then they played a really strong Uruguay side with Cavani on fire. So they can be given a pass for that round of 16 exit because Uruguay is another probably another top 10 national side in the world. Um, but yeah, I mean, Portugal is, is still, they're still one of the best teams in the world. And they can certainly, they can certainly go very far in the next Euros, possibly repeat. And they are going to be a contender in the next World Cup, without a doubt. Beyond a shadow of a doubt. And also Portugal... Um, ever since the early 90s, Portugal has always produced really compelling squads at the under-20 level. Um, if you look at their recent performances in the under-20 World Cup, they, I believe they got to the final in 2011, and they got to the semifinal in 2015. So among European nations who... Um, who perform in, in, in youth tournaments, Portugal is usually up there among the five or six best teams who consistently qualify for under 20s, under 17 World Cups. Um, so I think, you know, after once Ronaldo is gone, I think they'll be just fine. I think, I think they'll, just, they'll be just fine when Ronaldo leaves. Uh, A, t- a current top 10 in national teams. Um, hmm. Well, on the spot, in no particular order, I think you'd probably have to include the like. In no particular order, you'd probably have to include the likes of um, Belgium, France, Brazil, Portugal. I would put England as well, Uruguay, Spain, possibly the Netherlands. Um, how many teams is that? That's like eight that I named. And then the other two spots would probably be between like Germany and Argentina. You know what? Our Argentina, I would put Argentina in the top ten. Um then the ones that are just on the outside, just on the outside of the top 10 would be like Colombia and uh, Switzerland, Denmark and uh, Poland and, and the like. In the teens, like between 11 to 20. You know, uh, I have old videos on this channel where I rank every team in each confederation. Maybe, I don't know if you've seen it, but this is from like 2017. I did top 10 and at the time from each confederation. I've been thinking about doing an update video because it's been three years. And I wanted to do that this summer, but because of COVID, it's really hard to assess form. So what I think I'm going to do is it's probably going to be next summer once we get... World Cup qualifying games in once the Euros take place, once the Copa America take place. It would have been nice to do it this year, but a lot of international tournaments got canceled, unfortunately. Um, So, but I've been meaning to do that into an update. When do you guys think I should do it?
Okay. Christmas sounds of Christmas sounds fine. Okay. That can work. Have you seen the messy saga with Barca? Of course. <laughs> it's on the new it's on football and world news twenty four seven as we speak. Barca doesn't want to let him go. And um, it's looking like it might go to the courts on that one. And uh, if it does, I hope Messi wins because imagine how awkward it would be to have a player uh, that just doesn't want to be there anymore. (laughs) And they're basically just there because of a contract clause. That's that'd be pretty embarrassing. It, it just goes to show how how utterly shameless Barcelona, how the board and the leadership at Barcelona is. They just have no they have no shame whatsoever, uh, and it's just a complete lack of graciousness. And it's like okay, keep him there, but <laughs> you think he's gonna play his heart out for you? You think his head is going to be in the game day in and day out, every single game in the league, every single game in the Champions League, when he wants to get the hell out of Dodge? I would would feel embarrassed, personally. Like, if we had the best player in the world for my team and he's only there because he's forced legally to be there, I would... I would be blushing every time my my team took to the field because it would be a laughing stock. <sighs> Top 10, 20, 50 world teams every Christmas and every summer. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I could turn that into like a uh, a biannually kind of thing, twice a year. Just be weary because this Christmas, if I do that, it's going to be hard because of lack of football. Well, the Nations League will make it easier, truthfully. But it won't be a perfect list. But I'll do the best I can. Because at least with the Nations League, I'll have some games to base it on, right? And that starts in a few days. So that will that'll present some clarity, at least for the, uh, for the European game. Yes, that's true. You watch for the excitement. Yeah. I got to stop chewing on this pen. It's a bad idea. I do that when I'm like thinking about stuff. You know, like some people, they they bite their knuckles or like they smell their fingers or like, or if you're Yoki Low, you eat your own boogers. But I <laughs> I do that with my, with my pen too many times. I just like bite on the end of it. Um Uh, I don't know about that. All right, one minute. One minute left. I'm serious this time. One minute. You own top everything football for almost anything related with soccer are kind of like the best. I I don't think I understand your question, Samuel. What's your favorite drink? Favorite alcoholic drink? 
I enjoy a, a nice glass of chilled red wine, if I'm being honest. As pretentious as that sounds. Um, but I also don't mind a Tom Collins, a Tom Collins cocktail. Those are pretty good. Favorite non-alcoholic drink? Homemade Southern iced tea. How about you? What's your favorite drink? Bleach. <laughs> Lloyd said bleach. Goodness. I don't, it's not a good idea. I guess the blood of my victims. Toilet water. That's gross. Honestly, only about two or three times a month. Ever since my aunt passed away, I don't get to eat much Egyptian cuisine anymore. But sometimes my father will bring home something. And also, I, I can make falafel from scratch. It's not that hard. It's pretty easy. There's this one dish called koshari which is basically, it's a lot of carbs. <laughs> it has lentils, rice, and elbow pasta with like fried onions on top. And it's like in a sort of a tomato-based sauce. It's usually made in like a casserole. That's also really good. Um, there's also an Egyptian style goulash, which is like basically these meat pastries yeah, it's basically what it sounds like. It's like these multi-layered meat pastries that are that have like a lot of uh it's made with like phyllo dough, if you know what that is, phyllo dough and butter. It's good. Um Fool is also really good. It's basically like a a bean dip kind of thing, but not really a dip. It's like mashed beans that are that's seasoned with garlic and pepper and uh, lemon juice. And uh, you can put a couple of boiled eggs into it. It's very healthy for you, too. It's super healthy. It's a lot of protein. I like to have that with the, a side of tabbouleh. Tabbouleh is basically like a sliced cucumber salad with barley and tomatoes. Um you got to have pita with it too. You got to have hot pita bread with it too. <laughs> you know what's such an Egyptian thing to do? And my 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 father does this all the time. I don't know. He he puts a little bit, just a little bit of olive oil on everything. Like does it not cook with it? He'll just like like he'll get a tray of hummus, you know, like hummus dip, and he'll pour little teaspoons of olive oil on it. It's such a Middle Eastern slash Arab thing to do. And he does it. And me personally, I can't do that because it's kind of rough tasting when it's like raw, like, like when it's outside of cooking, when it, outside of uh, cooking purposes, like I can't do that, <laughs> but he likes to. Yeah. When my when my aunt was alive, she used to make these um, <laughs> these festive cookies called gorbea. I don't know how to spell it in English. Let me see if I can type it here in the comments, and maybe I can. You guys can Google it. 
Let me see. No. Cookies. I don't know how to spell it in English, but they're basically like Egyptian uh, butter cookies that have that are lightly dusted and like powdered sugar. They're really good. Um, she used to make that. They're good with tea. Here, okay, here's the proper spelling. Because spelling it in English is really strange. It's super weird. Like the translation across letters. One moment. G-H-R-A-Y. G-H-R-A-Y. B-E-H. There we go. There it is. It does have a lot of similarities to Turkish cuisine. It uses a lot of fresh ingredients, uh, a lot of um, lamb, lamb meat, lamb, L-A-M-B. Um, it is very similar. It's also very similar to Lebanese as well. It's kind of like shortbread in a way. Just a little bit more buttery. <laughs> but I don't get to eat it very often. I don't get to eat Egyptian cuisine very, very often nowadays. Especially since I moved. I'm further away from the city, so there's not many places around me that have such variety. Is anybody in my family Muslim? Not that I know of. Not that I know of. Yeah, there's restaurants in New York, but I recently moved down the shore in New Jersey, so I'm about an hour and a half away from the city. But I, I used to live like 20 minutes away from New York. You guys know what baklava, right? Is right? Baklava. You have to know what that is. Sweet pastry. That's just a popular Mediterranean dessert in general. I mean, there's Greek baklava, there's Syrian, there's, uh, there's Turkish, there's, you know. But there's also another one that is a variant of baklava. It's called kanafe. Let me see if I can spot find the spelling in English. Kanafe. It's similar to baklava. It's the same exact concept, except the pastry is kind of like shredded. It's like wiry. And you can fill it with anything you want. Honey, um, pistachio nuts. So those are usually the best nuts to use, pistachios. And a whole bunch of other stuff. Let me see if I could find one more. This is actually a lot of fun. You know... Hold on. There's one dish called Om Ali. Om Ali, it's the national dessert of Egypt. And it's basically like an Egyptian bread pudding. You ever have bread pudding? Well, 
and it's it's also it's it's made with like milk, well bread, like stale bread, milk, cream, sugar, and then you could add like nuts and honey and and other kinds of stuff to it. Um, and it's usually cooked in like a crock pot or like in a bowl. That's also really good. I've only had that twice ever in my entire life. Twice. Once when I was a child, and then once when I went to Egypt back in 2008. It's not very... It's not something that my family makes a lot, but that's how you spell it right there. Yeah, of course. You can find gyros and you have Egyptian gyros too. It's not that much different from Greek. It's more or less like um, lamb, lamb or beef usually. Shawarma, of course. Shawarma is like all over the Middle East. You can get that easily anywhere. Father's family is from the city of Ismailia, which is in eastern Egypt, it's near Port Suez, kind of closest to the Sinai Peninsula. Neighboring countries. Well, I've, mm, I've never been to Israel or Libya, so no. But I've been all over Egypt. All over, all over Egypt, uh, I'd say the closest I ever came to a, a, a bordering country was coming 50 miles away from the Sudanese border. I was in Aswan, Egypt, and then I went further south from Aswan, and I came very close to uh, the border with Sudan, but I didn't go into Sudan. And then my my mother's just American. Yeah, my mother is a uh, just a white American with European ancestry. That that's it. Well, technically, pecan pie, not apple pie, because my mom is from the South. She's a sweet old Southern belle, just a Southern lady. Distantly, yeah. But it's it's like so diluted, though. All right, yeah. Now we're two hours into the live stream. I'm going to have to end it here. I, I, I thought this was going to be only an hour long. Uh, I hope you guys have a good evening wherever you are. Um, have a good one. Thanks for joining me. Peace out.